Kef's new Q Concerto Meta. It, listen, it could be Concerto, it could be Concerto. I'm calling it Concerto because it sounds fancier to me. Retails for about $12.99 and is, at least in my opinion, one of, if not the best value for a bookshelf speaker as of now. And I've reviewed, I don't know, 160 speakers at this point. So that carries a lot of weight for me. It has really great in-room linearity, gets down to about 40 hertz in room, has excellent horizontal and vertical dispersion, which are huge factors. Most speakers don't have good vertical dispersion. And therefore, you can't really walk around the room. Your seating height is really fixed at a certain height. But with these speakers, you can do that. You can walk around the room and, and you don't have to worry about sitting with your head in a vise. That's pretty cool. I'm gonna give you a quick rundown while I show you a video of these speakers. It is a three-way design, which is currently the only three-way design in their budget lineup of the Q-Series speakers. It features a three-quarter inch vented aluminum dome tweeter with a matte absorber. It features a four-inch mid-range driver, which uses the UniQ technology with the tweeter in the middle for a coaxial design. It also has a six and a half inch aluminum cone base driver, a sensitivity spec at about 85 decibels, impedance at four ohm, recommended power is about 15 to 180 watts. It is a vented enclosure with a rear firing port and it weighs about 20.9 pounds or somewhere in the ballpark of 10 kilograms. A couple things up front, when I talk about distance of the speaker from the rear wall, this is what I'm talking about. When I talk about aiming a speaker and I say on axis versus off axis, on axis is the black here, red would be 30 degrees off axis and any other angle off axis would be somewhere in between. Most people will set up their speakers anywhere in this range from zero to 30 degrees off axis. Many designs are designed to be listened to with the speaker pointed directly at you, but some designs are designed to be listened to with the speaker pointed away from you with the red illustrating that example. Pros for this speaker is an excellent all around speaker. It rivals any speaker that I can recall to date in its size package. $12.99 per pair is not cheap. So I won't kid myself and I won't kid you by saying it's a budget speaker, but it is from the budget lineup of Q series speakers from Kef. It is their flagship speaker in this lineup and it is, it is the chef's kiss. I, I truly do believe that. I am gonna talk about how it compares to the R3 meta in a little bit, but I'll just tell you right now that it doesn't trump the R3 meta. So you don't have to worry about thinking, oh, is this much cheaper speaker going to beat the R3 meta that I own? No, the R3 meta is more linear speaker and it just flat out takes more output power. The way that this speaker compares to other speakers in its price range though, and the reason why I say it sounds better is because it features a very linear in-room estimated in-room response, which translates to a very linear, smooth sounding speaker that is much more accurate than other speakers in this price category. They get down to about 40 Hertz in-room with a nice solid thump. And that is the one thing that I noticed most about these speakers in my listening. When I fired them up initially, I thought, do I have any EQ settings from a previous speaker? Maybe I've bumped up the mid bass a little bit. So I double checked and I didn't. And so the more I listened, the more I was like, dang, these are really nice. I kind of ballparked the roll off around 45 Hertz. I just knew it was kind of a little bit below 50 Hertz, maybe a little bit above 40 Hertz. And when I looked at the data, I see that the F10 and the F3 work out to be roughly that ballpark. And I'm gonna show you why I say that in a little bit. The other thing that I like about the speaker a lot is that it has a very broad, well, reasonably broad horizontal dispersion as well as a relatively very broad vertical dispersion. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in the data, but really what I'm getting to right now is in the subjective sense, it doesn't really matter where you sit, you had the same tonality from the speaker. Now, the stereo imaging effect is gonna fall off if you move from one side to the other of that center listening position. That's just the effect of stereo. But in terms of tonality, you're still gonna have essentially the same sound characteristics as you sit in front of the speaker or if you sit off to the side. So let's say you're entertaining family or friends and they're sitting in your living room and you know you give them the crappy seat normally, right? Like you want the prom seat, so you give them the crappy seat. They're still gonna hear very much the same as what you're hearing in your primary listening position. And that's cool. You could also use the speaker as a center channel for a home theater system. So if you wanted to buy 
uh, maybe two sets of these and give one away to a friend or find somebody else to split the set with you, you could use that third speaker for a center channel. I think that would be a fantastic idea. And then maybe for home theater, if you don't want to spend the extra money for these, then maybe you could go with something like the Q1 meta or the Q3 meta, or something like that, a little bit more budget friendly. When listening to these, I found that bringing them out from the wall about two feet was kind of the sweet spot. The R3 Meta seems to do better when you push it closer to the wall, whereas with this speaker, it has a little bit more of a shallow roll off and bringing it a little bit out from the wall really helps to keep it from sounding too boomy. If you put it really close to a wall, let's say within a foot, then in my opinion, what happens is it's gonna sound a little bit too boomy in that 50 Hertz region. That, that bass is really gonna stand out a little bit more than maybe than you want it to. So when I pull the speaker out about two feet off the wall, it helped to alleviate some of that boominess, but it still had a solid, nice 40 to 50 hertz kick drum effect that I really enjoyed. The other thing that I really like about the speaker, again, is the linearity and the accuracy of its reproduction style, meaning that there's nothing that stands out about the speaker in a good way. There's not an elevated treble that really grates on your ears. There's not a suck out in the upper mid-range lower treble where you feel like you're missing attack or dynamics. There's not a really big dip in the mid-range where you feel like everything is hollow, or conversely, there's not a peak in the mid-range where you feel like everything is too boxy sounding. Overall, it's just a really neutral sounding speaker with a couple little caveats that we're gonna talk about in the data. In terms of cons, I mean, cause there's always gotta be a con, right? Not everything is sunshine and rainbows. The looks of the speaker are kind of plain, but having said that, I like it. This walnut finish that I've got, looks like a really nice finish. And by the way, I was loaned these pair of speakers from a friend. Now, Kef was going to send them to me, but my friend had them and he was like, hey, you want to check them out? So I borrowed them from him and that's how I was able to do this review. So thanks, you know who you are. The other downside of this speaker is there is a little bit of a mild mid-range dip around 200 Hertz. So that can take away from maybe the fullness in that particular region and maybe make it sound a little bit thin, but not to a significant detriment. And I'm gonna show you that in the data in a little bit. Um, the other thing about these speakers is that they do have a little bit of a low sensitivity. So manufacturer spec is at about 85. I'm capturing somewhere closer to about 84 decibels. Some of the other speakers in this size and class range typically have about 85 to 86 decibel sensitivity. So these are about one to two decibels lower. Now that's not a lot, but it might be just enough where you feel like maybe you need a little bit more power behind these to drive these to the output levels that you want. And sometimes I would say that that doesn't really even matter because if you crank a pair of speakers up, you're gonna run into significant distortion and or compression before it really takes advantage of the output capability that your amplifier can deliver. But with these speakers, they have pretty low distortion and compression. So if you're wanting to get the most out of these or maybe even use them in a home theater setup, you can do that. But keep in mind, you might need just a little bit more power than your current set of speakers, assuming that their average sensitivity of around 85 to 86 decibels. The other thing about these speakers that could be a pro or a con is their on-axis linearity. So their on-axis linearity in the high frequency tends to take a little bit of a dip. Now, they are designed that way on purpose to give you a smooth in-room response, which I personally, after 160 or 200 speakers, I mean, it's, it's a crazy number of speakers at this point, have determined that the estimated in-room response is more important to me than the flat on-axis response. As long as the estimated in-room response can deliver a smooth, somewhat linear response, and the on-axis and off-axis response also are smooth. I'm not saying they can be jagged as the heck, but as long as they're smooth, then I don't put so much emphasis on the on-axis response being completely flat. And you're gonna see what I mean about that in the data in a little bit. But having said that, because the on-axis response takes a little bit of a dip in the high frequency, what I found is that when you turn them slightly off-axis, maybe 10 to 15 degrees, I started to notice more shelving in the top end than I personally cared for. So my recommendation is to set these speakers up facing directly at you, or if you tow them off axis, you may find that using a tonality adjustment is gonna help bring up that top end a little bit. And that's perfectly okay to do that with these speakers because they take very well to equalization thanks to their practically constant directivity, which again is also the best in class. 
So now let's talk about the data and I'm gonna go through this a little bit more quickly than I do normally because frankly, there's not a lot to talk about in terms of cons and usually that's when I get bugged down or bogged down in the data is because there's a lot of little issues going on. But I also wanna talk about the R3 meta comparison. So I'm gonna to try to speed through this a little bit. The data will all be on my website shortly, aaronsaudiocorner.com, okay? First off is the impedance data looks good. Minimum impedance of about 3.3 ohm. Probably gonna need an amplifier capable of four ohm to drive these speakers to good output levels. Average sensitivity is about 84.2 decibels. F3 is down at 53 Hertz. That's where you get that robust kick drum. F10 is at 35 Hertz. Now notice that I'm pointing out the decreasing high frequency plus the near constant directivity down here equals a linear in-room response. So I actually reached out to Kef's engineers who designed the speaker and I asked them about this just to verify that my thinking about this combination of trending downward high frequency plus practically constant directivity equals a nice smooth in-room response. And they told me that yes, they were shooting for the estimated in-room response target to be linear. And if they had boosted this high frequency, or should I say, if they had made the high frequency flat, what would have happened is, at least in my experience, you would have had a bright sounding speaker in room. Let's look at the CEA 2034 data set. Same thing you saw a second ago, smooth listening window, great early reflections, sound power, great directivity, class leading directivity, estimated in room response. And with the line indicating how I heard the speaker in room, extension down to about 40 Hertz in room. There's a mild upper mid bass dip, which I talked about previously, Excellent off-axis sound, basically saying that you're gonna get the same sound sitting in front of the speaker or sitting off to the side of the speaker. And see how this is really linear? Again, if the speaker were flat on axis, what would happen is this black line would flatten out right through here and it would cause the speaker to sound a little bit more bright than I personally would care for. But if you find that this is a little bit too dipped, you can always just bring this up via EQ. Horizontal contour plot, plus or minus 60 degrees, nice. Vertical contour plot, plus or minus about 50 degrees. And it should be practically the same as the horizontal because it's a concentric design. But there are other little things such as the height of the cabinet versus the width of the cabinet. They're gonna help drive some of that as well. 86 decibel distortion, 96 decibel distortion. Both look really good. Multi-tone distortion also looks really good for a speaker of this size. There's a little bit of a bump in the mid-range right through here that might stand out as a little bit grainy or compressed if you're listening to these at 96 decibels at one meter, but I didn't really notice that in my listening. What about if you use a subwoofer and cross these at 80 hertz, you decrease a little bit of that mid-range distortion right through here, but not a lot. Compression looks really good on this speaker, so you're gonna have high dynamic range out of this speaker. Now let's talk about the comparison between the R3 Meta and this speaker. So again, the CEA 2034 data from the Concerto, versus the R3 Meta. Now notice two things, namely, the extension on R3 Meta, it starts to roll off and then it has a little bit of a kick up. That's an extended base shelf design. I'm gonna go back up to the Concerto. It doesn't have that. Notice it rolls off a little bit more smoothly through this region. That's why I say that the Concerto would probably do better brought out a little bit further from the wall than the R3 Meta. We're on the Concerto, see this high frequency dip through here? Go back to the R3 Meta, it's more flat on axis through here. But see this right here? This is akin to the estimated interim response. It's not exactly, but it's close enough to it. And you can see how this kind of flattens out a little bit. Therefore, the R3 Meta directly on axis would sound a little bit bright. In my review for the R3 Meta, I recommended that you tow it slightly off axis by about 10 degrees. If I go back to the Concerto, you can see that this is much more smooth than the high frequency. So you can point it directly at you and it won't sound bright at all. Now I'm not saying the R3 Meta sounds bright like in a terrible way, but compared to the Concerto, the thing that you would notice for me is the extreme ends, the bass and the high frequency. The Concerto seems to be a little bit wider and I did ask the engineer about this and he said that they're both around plus or minus 50, but in my data, what I'm seeing is something closer to about plus or minus 60 degrees for the Concerto and about plus or minus 50 for the R3 Meta. Now, of course, where you draw this line is somewhat subjective, okay? So I'm not saying that my interpretation of this data is the end-all be-all because there's degrees of variance here. For example, it even dips down to about 40 degrees right there at about, what is that, 4K? And this speaker kind of bounces around just a little bit, so it depends on the exact frequency. But overall, it seems to me, based on the data, that the Concerto may be a tad bit wider in its radiation. But again, 
I want to emphasize that that's just my interpretation of this data. Vertical for the concerto, I said about plus or minus 50 degrees, but again, depends on where you draw the line. Compared to the R3 Meta, they're both about plus or minus 50 degrees. Harmonic distortion at 96 dB for the concerto, and then the R3. So you can see that the R3 through the lower mid range is more clean. Concerto again, but the concerto seems to have lower distortion below about 50, 60 Hertz. What about multi-tone distortion? Concerto, R3 meta. So the R3 meta in general seems to do better through the mid range, where the concerto has a little bit of a bump in the 500 Hertz region. Now in summary for the comparison between the R3 meta and the concerto, I would say that the concerto is a very close rival. It is different in certain ways and that you may still prefer the R3 meta. So don't feel like if you own it that you missed out by the speaker that's almost half the price because the R3 meta is still a superb speaker. And in some regards, it is actually better objectively and subjectively than the concerto, but the concerto really holds its own. And in my opinion, best pretty much every speaker that I've seen in its price class. There are a couple that are maybe rivals to it, something like the Ascend Audio Sierra 1, I believe it is. That's a really good speaker, but it's lower sensitivity and doesn't have as good vertical dispersion pattern. I think it's overall linearity is really quite good as well though. And that wraps up my review. Again, the Concerto is a badass speaker at about $1,300 per pair. I have zero problem recommending it. If you are interested in purchasing it, I do have generic affiliate links in the description section below. Please click one of those links to Amazon or Crutchfield and then go buy the speaker. It helps me out. It earns me a small commission at no additional cost to you. Or if you wanna buy anything through those links, such as new socks, new underwear, maybe a comb, maybe a television, maybe a projector, maybe a battery for your car. I don't know, whatever you need. Just remember, click that link. That really helps me out and I really appreciate it. Alternatively, you can join me at patreon.com where you get inside access to upcoming reviews, suggestions for what I should be reviewing, help deciding what I should be reviewing next via polls, and just general behind the scenes information. And I very much appreciate that as well, because as you know, this is not my day job, but I do use this to supplement whatever I can in order to help me out because this stuff, it ain't free. So I appreciate any little help that I can get from you guys. With all that said, I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.